Watch this. Answer, guilty, 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 guilty. After years of investigation and six weeks in an Idaho courtroom, Lori Vallow now knows her fate. The KTVB team is following the developing verdict from unique angles live for you on this Friday evening. Blue carpet to a red carpet environment. We are chatting with Idaho's Lieutenant Governor Scott Bedke about his transition into Idaho's second highest political office. So what's the view from the top? Idaho is set to host some high-powered, heavy action playoff hockey. We went behind the scenes and all around, really, to bring you the sights and sounds of the unique hockey environment right here in Boise. Turn out the lights. <laughs> the party's over. They say that all good things must end. Laurie, it ended. That's right, the trial of Lori Vallow is now complete. The long-awaited verdict is in, and yes, she is guilty on all six charges. We haven't covered the Lori Vallow situation much here on the 208, but we felt like today's verdict really is at the center of attention across our community and really across the country. So we wanted to dive into it with our team. And if you've never heard this woman's name before, which is unlikely, we'll tell you she is now guilty of the murder and conspiracy in the deaths of her two kids and her husband's former wife nearly four years ago now. Six charges that Ms. Vallow was found guilty on are the following. Conspiracy to commit first-degree murder of Tylee Ryan. First-degree murder of Tylee Ryan. Conspiracy to commit first-degree murder for J.J. Vallow. First-degree murder of J.J. Vallow. Conspiracy to commit first-degree murder, Tammy Daybell, and grand theft. And our Morgan Romero is live this evening for us at the Ada County Courthouse where everything has gone down over the last several weeks. And Morgan, I know you and Shira have been following this very closely here at the end. What happened? We have, Joe, thank you for going through those charges. 12 men and women found Lori Vallow guilty on all those charges you just listed a little before 1 o'clock this afternoon. That verdict, as it has to be, was unanimous. It comes after about six weeks of testimony and at times very horrific evidence. Around the courthouse today, both inside and outside, everyone was awaiting this conviction anxiously. There was a lot of anticipation. People had knots in their stomachs. They said reporters, myself included, sort of shaking. That also includes lead detective from the Rexford Police Department, Ray Hermosillo, who's been on this case since the get-go, did a welfare check at Lori's house looking for JJ back in November of 2019. Shira and I saw him pacing the hallway on the fourth floor of the courthouse with the lead prosecutor in this case, Rob Wood, both of them at the time, of course, very anxious. Our Alexandra Duggan was inside the courtroom. She reported seeing Hermosillo uh, looking like he was wiping tears from his eyes, shaky as well as that verdict was read. The judge told everyone inside the courtroom ahead of the verdict being read, not to react loudly, to keep order in the court, but outside the courthouse, it was a different story. The defendant would please rise. We, the jury, duly impaneled and sworn to try the above entitled action for our verdict, unanimously answer the questions submitted to us as follows. Question number one. In regards to count one of the amended indictment, is Lori Noreen Vallow not guilty or guilty of conspiracy to commit first-degree murder of Tylee Ryan and grand theft by deception? Answer, guilty. Not guilty or guilty of first-degree murder of Tylee Ryan. Answer, guilty. Is Lori Noreen Vallow not guilty or guilty of conspiracy to commit first degree murder of Joshua Jackson Vallow and grand theft by deception. Answer, guilty. Is Lori Noreen Vallow not guilty or guilty of first degree murder of Joshua Jackson Vallow? Answer, guilty. Is Lori Noreen Vallow not guilty or guilty of conspiracy to commit first degree murder of Tamara Tammy Daybell? Answer, guilty. Is Lori Noreen Vallow not guilty or guilty of grand theft? Answer, guilty. Life sentence, Lori. Yeah. I 
asked a source close to the prosecution if at any point they ever doubted that jurors would convict Lori of murdering her kids. This source said that, of course, prosecutors always get nervous in a trial about whether jurors will agree with them on all counts, but they said they felt their case was really solid and they're really grateful. They're not going on camera because of Chad Daybell's pending trial next year, but they did send us a statement. I'm going to read you part of it. They say they're committed to pursuing justice for the victims. They said, we are very pleased with the jury's verdict and we want to thank them as well as the alternates for their service over the last six weeks during this trial. They also thanked countless law enforcement and community members who worked tirelessly to hold Lori accountable. Many onlookers, as you heard, cheered once all six guilty counts were read. Some even cried. Rhonda Shields is one of those who cried. She says she's been following this case since the kids were reported missing and she has deep ties to Rexburg. I came yesterday because I wanted to just, you know, give a little support and I was amazed at how different it feels actually being here and amongst people who no matter what other beliefs are going on, everybody's here to show support and hope for justice for the people that have lost their lives through all this. I also talked to a woman who was selected for jury duty in this case, but didn't get chosen to sit on the jury. She showed up today to see it through. The verdict came down quickly. Jurors started deliberating around 2 p.m. yesterday after closing arguments from both sides, and they went for more than four hours last night. Today, though, they deliberated for about three hours. Attorneys say it's impossible to predict when a jury will deliver a verdict, especially in a complicated case like this, where so much evidence was presented and not necessarily chronologically. The jury decided what the facts are based on the evidence presented, including witnesses testimony and they had to apply it to Idaho law. They determined the state proved beyond a reasonable doubt all of the crimes happened. To be found guilty of first degree murder in Idaho, the jury did not have to believe Lori actually physically killed Tylee, JJ or Tammy, just that she told someone or encouraged someone to do it. In the defense's closing arguments yesterday, Jim Archibald pinned the case on Chad Daybell. He said he manipulated Lori using religion. Archibald told jurors the state has a complete lack of proof Lori killed her kids because she never explicitly said so and never had a plan. The defense said people testify that she was a good mom and spent her entire life protecting her kids. Clearly, though, jurors disagreed. During closing arguments yesterday, the prosecution said the evidence is clear. Lori was involved. Lori never reported her own kids missing and continued to collect money the kids were getting. Prosecutors closed the same way they opened. Very powerful, compelling statement. They told jurors this case is about money, power and sex and justice for the victims requires a guilty verdict. So what happens next? Well, because this is Fremont County's case, they are going to take Lori from Ada County to Fremont County within the next week. She'll go to jail there, and then her sentencing is scheduled for three months from now. Again, that'll take place in Fremont County, and at that time, Lori could face the rest of her life behind bars. Joe? All right, Morgan Romero reporting live from the Ada County Courthouse. We'll have more from Morgan later this evening. Thank you so much. Well, for all the families involved in this situation, they've been waiting for justice, and this verdict has been a long time coming. And our Shira Matsuzawa, she's been covering this really for three years, really since the very beginning of all of this, and she was there for the trial every day. It comes to an end here today, Shira, and I know that you've been in touch with the families. Yeah, you know, it's, a, it's been a long time coming, as you mentioned. They've been waiting for more than three years, and it's been a moment that these families have been waiting for justice, right? And after moments after that verdict was read, JJ's grandparents, Kay and Larry Woodcock, they actually came out of the courthouse and talked with the media. JJ and Tylee went missing in September of 2019, and it was JJ's grandparents, Kay and Larry Woodcock, who sounded the alarm when they couldn't get a hold of JJ, and they asked for a welfare check. So today, a big day for them. Today, they embraced one another as that verdict was read. Larry said he told Kay he loved her when he heard that guilty verdict. And we'll hear from them in just a moment. You'll also hear from Tylee's aunt, Annie Cushing. I'm sure everyone has paid attention in court. I want to personally thank and I want to personally hug every one of those jurors. What they went through, what they saw is mind boggling. I hope that nobody ever has to go through this. I hope nobody ever has to see and hear the details of what happened to JJ, to Tylee, and to tell me. I feel elated. I mean, it's, you know, it's been three and a half years waiting for this day. And, you know, I was just 
absolutely over the moon that she was convicted on all seven charges. Now, I've spoken with Annie several times over the years when the kids first went missing and then when their remains were later found. But she stopped talking publicly a couple of years ago until today. And you'll hear more of my interview with her coming up on the news at 6 and 10, as well as what the Woodcocks had to say after that verdict was read. But a lot of emotions today, Joe. Yeah. A lot of emotions. And you've been following it for the last three years. Does it feel like it's been three years or? You know, it's been off and on, especially I think COVID also. Mm -hmm. There were so many delays. And then obviously uh, Lori also had a mental hold there as well. And so that impacted this trial and moving forward. So it kind of felt like, it, I think uh, family members have told me that it felt like this moment never was going to happen, you know, because it, there were so many delays throughout those years. Yeah. But here we are. Well, we are looking forward to uh, more of your interview coming up at 6 o'clock with Annie Cushing. And I do want to say that we are going to continue our coverage of this trial deep into tonight and the days to come. And you can scan the QR code on your screen right now for a link to all of our coverage from throughout the trial dating back several years. We are going to take a step aside, but the 208 returns right after this. Ever change jobs? Yeah, it can be a little wild learning a whole new routine. Idaho's Lieutenant Governor made a leap across the building for his new job. Ahead, we hear from Lieutenant Governor Scott Betke on his move from House Speaker to his brand new office. And yeah, that includes watching over the Senate. We'll ask him how that went. Something fun to share with us? Maybe a hot take? We did love the original art you sent in last Friday. Whatever it is though, text us right now. Here's our number. 208-321-5614. And of course, as always, please be sure to include your name and hashtag the 208. We're going to get to some of your comments or whatever you send in live at the end of the show. As Idaho lawmakers look forward to the next legislative session, state leaders continue to evaluate the impacts of the new laws that most will go into effect on July 1st, a.k.a. the beginning of the fiscal year. But you guys know all of this. We covered it on the 208, and the lawmakers, they covered a lot of ground during the session. But for perspective on the view of Idaho from our state's top leaders, this week we hosted Lieutenant Governor Scott Bedke on our Viewpoint program. And Lieutenant Governor Bedke went from Speaker of the House to his new position, and part of his role is to lead the Idaho Senate. He was just running the House for several years. How hard could it be, right? Our Doug Petcast chatted with Bedke on the topic of the major differences between the room with blue carpet and the room with red carpet in the Senate. You know, you went from one ro rostrum <laughs> as Speaker of the House to a different rostrum as you know, President or of the Senate. Um, how big of a difference is there in that role? <clears throat> I know that you know with Speaker, you had a lot of power with, with the actual legislation. Well, yeah, that's true. I, uh, as the Lieutenant Governor and as the President of the Senate, I didn't ever vote. I vote when there is a tie. 
and so I'm the presiding Did officer. Did you have that opportunity no, this year? No, not this year. I had people call me up and say, hey, uh, how would you vote on this? I might, I might not be here for the vote, and then depending on what I would tell them, they would either leave or not leave, but I never had, I never had to break a tie this year. Uh, and, the, and, you know, but it was, I was very comfortable after, as you said, the, the years I served as speaker to being in the, in presiding there. And there's just enough change between the, and maybe at the nuance level of being uh, presiding in the Senate that, that my colleagues down in the Senate would keep tally of all the different little mistakes, the little different references to the House or to the clerk and not the secretary. And, uh, uh, you know, and there was a lot of good-natured ribbing there. <laughs> but uh, I, by the end, I was, I was pretty conversant in the Senate dialogue. So you'll get the terminology yeah. down, right? Doug and the lieutenant governor also dove into a lot of the deep politics here in Idaho that are being talked about. Education, of course, they dove into that. Really an interesting conversation. Join us, though, on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. right here on 7 for Viewpoint with Doug Petcash. As you can hear, some insights into the backroom politics there at the Idaho legislature. You never know what you'll learn on Viewpoint. Pretty incredible, and we could even see a rainbow Sunday, later Sunday. I'll tell you why. First of all, here's just a look at the weekend forecast and follow me on this. You're looking at this for tonight. This is the very latest satellite, and you notice that we've got a clear evening tonight. It's going to be beautiful if you're going to be outside, even late. Yeah, temperatures are going to be mild, not much of a difference. But I've been watching this moisture over here. 
in the eastern portion of the state and also in Wyoming and northern Montana. And it is showing that it is producing itself a little bit stronger to give a little bit more of a tilt. It's going to be on the direct western edge of that, but that could be a thunderstorm that could be moving into our area as we get into late Saturday night or especially Sunday afternoon. OK, so tomorrow turns out pretty well. If you look at the future cast, you see in the morning we have the sunshine. It continues, but this is what happens as we move toward later into the evening on Saturday. It's also into Sunday morning. Watch what comes up for Sunday afternoon. Just see some clouds and just some moisture that'll move in and even the chance of an isolated thunderstorm. It's not a lot of rain out of this. In fact, most of this uh, we're looking at about a hundredth of an inch for tomorrow, maybe three hundredths of an inch for Sunday morning. And then as we get a little further along to Sunday afternoon, there might be a tenth of an inch, maybe a little bit more if you happen to be near a thunderstorm. But have a good weekend. Thank you very much, Rick. Well, the Idaho Steelheads Hockey Club are set to take the ice tonight in Game 3 of the Mountain Division Finals. Oh yeah, playoff hockey. Idaho leads the series 2-0, so they are two wins away from achieving the Conference Finals. And we follow the Steelheads closely here on the 208, and we talk a lot about the environment at the Idaho Central Arena. Around the league, people know it's tough to play in Idaho, but we know that not everyone can get to all the games, partially attribute that to the amazing sellout streak, but we did want to capture the sights and sounds of playoff hockey in Boise, and this past Wednesday night was filled with extra emotion. Idaho is currently in a playoff series and a battle with the Allen Americans, and of course, Allen, Texas, where they call home, had a horrible tragedy last weekend. Eight people killed in a mass shooting at a community mall. KTVB photojournalist John Mark Crum captured the feel and special environment of an emotional evening on and off the ice. It's game two tonight between the Steelheads and the Americans from downtown Boise. Good evening, hockey fans. Cam McGuire here alongside Joe Paris from KTVB News. As our thoughts and prayers are with the Allen, Texas community after the tragic event that took place on Saturday at the Outlet Mall. <laughs> It's only game two of a best of seven. Oh, yeah, and there's a lot of hockey to be played not only here tonight, but the rest of the series. Underway here from downtown Boise inside the Idaho Central Arena. Oh. Kawaguchi, right dot, pulls a shot, they score! your chirp game on in in hockey it's a chirp game so selfish you just give it to them it's and they give it back most times they'll say hey i'll sign your lunch box and then you you know you retort i don't want to give away my secrets but i've been at this for 25 years so i've got a few good chirps myself it's not really something we can put on tv Puck drop tonight is at 710 in downtown Boise. Game four is tomorrow night in the city of trees. Game five would be Sunday afternoon if needed. And for those of you asking, yes, I do broadcast some of the Steelhead games alongside the voice of the Steelheads, Cam McGuire. So when I do see you at the arena, I appreciate you coming up and saying hi. So hopefully I'll see you there tomorrow. All right. 
Congratulations are in order to the senior classes all around Idaho who are graduating. We'll start with the College of Western Idaho. They've got graduation earlier, uh, and uh, they also have it tonight at the Extra Mile Arena. More than 1,700 students are receiving honors, ranging in age from 17 to 75. And tomorrow, nearly 2,300 vandals will walk for the University of Idaho ceremony in Moscow. Congratulations to all the 2023 grads. All right, the comment Tron 7000 is fired up, so let's see what it has. Oh, that was a good one, Carl. Okay, this person says, I can't believe it'll take another three months for the vowel sentence to be handed down. She's guilty, there's no question, so what on earth will take? Uh, so there's a lot of processes that happen in between the verdict and the sentencing. There's a lot of paperwork. There's a lot of processes that have to get down. So that's kind of why we'll see this gap there. It also kind of lets the temperature kind of cool on the room there. But of course, we'll be following all that closely. This person says, can the grandfather get the grandkids' bodies back after the verdict, or does that have to wait until the end of the Chad trial? That's Kathy and Boise. It's a really good question. I'll ask our battle experts, and we can circle back to that one maybe next week. And uh, this person wanted to know about the relationship between the governor and lieutenant governor. Much different now, I'll tell you that. See you Monday. <laughs>